I want to preach the conclusion of my message uh, going through the ten trials of Israel. I hope you've uh, not become weary on me. hope you are staying with me. This is great material here. And I didn't really get a chance to finish up last week about the end of the Israelite generation, the end of the congregation. I pray that we have a happy end. Isn't it great if we could all kind of like the storybook, live happily ever after? Uh, you know, we can't do that on this earth, unfortunately. Uh, we can never really say to live happily ever after. That can only take place in heaven. Uh, this life is a wilderness. We're pilgrims. It's a journey. And the only time we're going to live happily ever after is when we get that arms of the Lord wrapped around us and we hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so I entitled this, Egypt or the Promised Land, and uh, really it's the, the conclusion of the evil report, because Israel has come up close to the banks of the Jordan, they sent out the 12 spies, we know that 12 men went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. You know, as little kids, they never told us the end of the story. You know what happened to those 10 spies? Do you know what God did to the 10 spies who were negative, who said, we can't take it, we can't take the land, and discouraged Israel, they went into rebellion. We're going to find out they, uh, they were going to stone Moses. I didn't realize how close it came. We're in Numbers chapter 14 this morning, Numbers 14, and you know, Moses sure came close to getting stoned along with Aaron and Joshua. Of course, Joshua was one of those 12 spies, and Caleb, another righteous man, so really, it's uh, the promised land or bust, right? Because to go back to Egypt is to throw in the towel. It's like Cain, to quit on his faith. As Christians, we don't want to be quitters. We don't want to throw in the towel. Some of you boxing fans remember the rematch of Roberto Duran and Sugar Ray Leonard? I think it was in 78, and if I got my year right, but uh, late 70s, uh, Duran had won the fight in Montreal, but this time it was Sugar Ray Leonard's match, and he came out and uh, strong in the first round. And Roberto Duran, he hit him with some hard shots. And in Spanish, we learned some new vocabulary. No mas, no mas. Roberto Duran quit the fight. He said, no more. I pray to God that we'll finish our fight. Pray to God we'll go 15 rounds with the devil. Pray that we'll, like Paul, finish our course, fight the good fight, and get the crown that's laid up for us. Not just some beautiful tiara with jewels, but that we'll get the Stephanos, crown of victory, the Olympic crown. And so it's the promised land or bus. Now, there was such a thing in American history called the Oregon Trail. Do you remember the Oregon Trail? Everybody got on their wagons and left the Mississippi River. St. Louis, I think, was their jumping off point and followed the river, the Missouri River, the Platte River, going west over the Rocky Mountains. And they were trying to get to the Pacific, Oregon, the Oregon Trail. And unfortunately, not everyone made it. There were so many pitfalls. And it reminds me of our life. It reminds me of our story here of, uh, well, Numbers chapter 14. And let's pick up here. In verse 1, I'll, I'm going to reiterate a few things from last week, and then we're going to keep going. Numbers 14, verse 1, it says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. Yeah, that would have been the answer to our problems. Have you ever felt... Uh, like that? Have you ever felt like death was the only solution? I wonder today, there's a lot of people in this world who really uh, have no hope in life, no hope whatsoever. And uh, when you get to the point where there's no hope, you know, you cry out for God and there's nothing left. It's really life or death, blessings or cursings. And, you know, when you get to, that, to the end of your rope like that, that's when the faith of Jesus Christ should kick in. That's why we're here this morning, to bolster that faith. 
There's some negatives, of course, and there's been some negatives along the way. I, I know that you realize that. It's a strong message sometimes, and I pray that, you know, for the strong, you're getting meat. And this message and these series of messages have been designated to bolster your faith and to beef you up because we want to be strong with God. And Paul castigated the Hebrews Christians. He said, uh, you guys, your arms are drooping down and your legs are weak and we want to do some spiritual calisthenics and the Word of God is designed to make us strong. It should be a blessing to us. It should help us to be better Christians. It should help us in our marriages because many marriages today might be on the rocks, maybe in the congregation, maybe those who are watching on the internet. Maybe you're suffering in the workplace, maybe your job, maybe the cares of life are weighing you down. And you feel like, you know, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Life is a wilderness. The things of Israel are written especially for today. They weren't written for the Israelites. We know that from 1 Corinthians 10. They were examples for us upon whom the ends of the age have come. So they're really written for church members. They're written for Christians. Now, here's what they said. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land? You know, whenever you, you got to be so careful. You ask why. That's one of the most risky questions that you can ask is why. And when you ask God why, they asked why, but it was a negative why. There's nothing wrong. Job, in a sense, you know, is written to ask the question why. But, if you, but Job really never asked why, if you read uh, the verses. All Job said was, naked I came into this world, naked I'm going out, and blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, when we can get to be like Job, when we can get to be like Joshua and Caleb and have that kind of faith so we don't crack up. Simply put, we don't want to crack up. How many people crack up on God? And these people cracked up. In fact, that was my title last week, spiritual crack-ups. People crack up, and you find out they had no faith at all. This isn't the world. I'm not talking about the Muslims and the Buddhists and the, the Shinto. I'm not talking about the atheists. I'm talking about church members. The word atheist really it doesn't mean against. It doesn't mean they're against God, anti-God. A in, in the Greek means without. Without there, an atheist is simply somebody who's without God. Theos, God. They're without God. I wonder how many atheists we have in our congregation. If we are to judge it by our prayer life, how many people? I wonder how many Christians truly pray like we should. And, you know, I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. I'm not talking about, you know, saying grace at the table. I'm talking about a real prayer life. How many people really talk to God? Does He exist? Does he exist in our lives? Or are we functional atheists? Functional Christian atheists. Now, that's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Practically, functionally, we're atheists. We're without God, and we don't even know it. How about when we get in trouble, when we go through a crisis in our life, tribulation? Who's the, what's the first thing we do? The first thing we should do is get on our knees and pray. I remember one time one of our children was lost, and we were scared because we couldn't account for this person. And, and uh, my dad was, it was on a night, Tuesday night, and it was CKC, one of our Bible colleges. And the first thing my dad did is he, he started praying. You know, there might be somebody that says, well, we need him to come out and help. Look, you know, why is he praying? Well, he's appealing to the most powerful force in the universe. And we, we can look for our child until they're blue in the face. They were playing hide and go seek, crawled under the bed and fell asleep. We didn't know it. Somebody's missing. You know, first, you know, uh, called the police, went out with a police scanner, firemen show up. We had all these police people showing up. I mean, God bless our police. God bless our law enforcement, our fire, rescue, the emergency uh, squad. We've got dedicated people, don't we? Don't we have dedicated people, service? But I'll tell you, you know, what gives us security? The, the greatest force we can unleash is the, is, the, is the ear of the Almighty God. And yet how many of us don't take advantage of the greatest weapon for success, efficiency, survival? And that's prayer on our knees before the Almighty God. So I don't want us to crack up. You know, everybody wants to call somebody. Everybody has a sugar daddy, I said before. You know, they want to call their sugar daddy to come and bail them out. Is there anybody richer than our sugar daddy in heaven? Huh? 
Uh, what in the world? We good? Here? Thank you. What in the world? I can't stand this stuff. I hate computers. All right, so you have 10 wicked spies. I'm in verse 5, Numbers 14. Let's pick up. At least we'll get a Bible story out of our sermon this morning. Then we have, so we have the unbelieving, unbelieving Israel. Here, the 12 spies came back, and 10 of them said, we can't take it. They're mightier than us. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Unfortunately, there's giants in the land. Giants in the land. Two righteous men said, we can take it. I mean, didn't we have a God who brought us across the Red Sea? Smash Pharaoh's army, 400 years of, of servitude brought to an end, we can take it. So who's right? You got 10 ungodly men, you got two righteous men. You know, I pray that our, the book of Hebrews chapter 5 says something about that you're through the word of God, through training in the word, through, uh, through your faith, we should have our senses exercised. The senses there, it's not talking about our five senses, they're talking about our mental faculties. I pray that our Christians here this morning will be wise enough, smart enough in the Lord to be able to judge, to discern, to discern whether, whether something is good or bad, whether something is of the Lord or not of the Lord. I pray that we will be able to discern an evil report from ten men or a righteous report from two men. I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't we be able to come to a, to a valid, truthful decision? You had two men, Caleb and Joshua. I mean, right away, Joshua, would you put stock in Joshua? He's Moses' right-hand man. He's up on the mountain. When Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the law, jo Joshua's halfway. Now, they didn't know Joshua in the Hebrew meant Jesus in the Greek. They didn't know that Joshua was a picture of Jesus. Moses didn't get into the promised land, unfortunately. Even Moses didn't, but Joshua did. Joshua brought the people into the promised land. Jesus brings his people into heaven. Now, what better typology can you get than that? So why wouldn't we put stock in, in, in the report of Joshua and Caleb? So they brought the evil report. Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly, gathered there. Joshua, the son of Nun, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, they tore their clothes. That was, that was a, a Jewish Hebrew way of showing your disappointment, your disgust, your righteous indignation. They realized that they had gotten so close and yet weren't going to get in. And they said to the Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. You know, isn't that great? The Lord is with us. Paul says in Philippians, if the Lord be with us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8. If the Lord be with us, who can be against us? but their true nature was revealed. Numbers 14, 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. How would you like to go into the ministry of Old Testament Israel? The whole assembly talked about stoning them. You know, I don't know what the conversation, how it would have went down. Hey, look at that rock. Man, that's a great rock. How many stitches does it have? I don't know. Can you read the, you know, the... Stitches of a, of, a, of a rock as you're going to throw it. Right-handed, left-handed. What do you want to do? Throw a curveball, knuckleball, fastball? I don't know. I, it, it, the stoning was the Old Testament way of capital punishment. Aren't you glad we don't live under the law anymore? We don't live under that anymore. And that's not the way you run a nation. President Obama made an off-handed joke, a caustic remark, making fun of the Bible. I don't know if you know that or not. He said, whoa, are we going to go out and stone homosexuals? We're not under the law. We're under the law of Christ, not the law of Moses anymore. He ought to know that the book of Hebrews says that the first law was null and void. It's the second law that went, in, went under effect. We don't run our country like that. That was a theocracy. Those were special days in the Old Testament. 
So that's to answer the question of a snide remark, if he was really serious. Paul gives a list in 1 Corinthians 6 of all these great sins, adulterers, fornicators, idolaters, some things like that. And he said, such of these are worthy of death. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says uh, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. In Romans chapter 1, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, he says they're worthy of death. We're not talking about by a government. Those who do these things are worthy of death. We're talking about the, the eternal hellfire. God is going to take care of the capital punishment. We don't stone people for being sinners. We don't be stoned. When Paul says they're worthy of death, you know, you can take things in the Bible out of context. All right? So don't, you know, no person has ever died, no sinner has ever died uh, for his sin at the hands of fundamentalist Christians, even though I'm probably not a fundamentalist, probably not even an evangelical. I'm just a Christian. The Lord's not going to threaten anybody's life with their sin. He's, he's going to threaten our afterlife, but he's not going to threaten our life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, we'll go to hell. But what's the whole story here? It wasn't, this, it wasn't some fundamentalist, uh, you know, radical sect of religionists who are going to put him to death. He's going to, Moses is going to be stoned by his own congregation. And we found out that in the heat of the moment, that's who they really were. They were enemies of God that Moses was leading. Somebody said that you could take those people out of Egypt, but you couldn't get Egypt out of the Israelites. You could take the Israelites out of Egypt, you couldn't get Egypt out of the Israelites. They loved, they loved Egypt. They loved their slavery. They loved living as slaves in Egypt more than they loved the perseverance with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Except you be reprobates. In Numbers 14, verse, 35, verse 34, do you know what God said? There's a correlation here. I was impressed we got to prove ourselves and examine ourselves. I can't think of a better time to examine myself than when we come around the Lord's table. It's an examination. And you know, if we're, if we're in sin, you know what God will say for the Christian? For those in Christ Jesus coming around his table, we examine ourselves, and we're thinking about the cross. We're thinking about Christ crucified, his blood, the atonement, everything that was accomplished at Calvary. And if we do something that merits discipline from God, Paul said we're chastened of the world. We examine ourselves. We are chastened by the Lord. You know what God will do sometimes? He'll get his switch. And as a church member, as a Christian, if we commit sin, he's, he has to say, bend over. And we get our spanking from God. But you know what? At least we're at peace with him. You know that he's dealing with you as a loving son. Hebrews chapter 12, no. Any father who withholds discipline doesn't love his son. Hebrews 12, a father who disciplines his son loves his son. That's what God says. That's what God's Word says. And I'd rather get it now. I'd rather get my spanking now than to get it eternally forever in the, in the lake of fire. Amen? So we've got to examine ourselves to see whether we're truly in the Lord or whether we're a reprobate. I love these old King James words. In fact, I love King James, uh, not because I can say a bad word, but in Hebrews 12, the old King James said that if you don't spank your son, then they're a bastard. So one time you can say that word. It's an undisciplined son. It has nothing to do with illegitimacy with God. It has nothing to do with the wedding date, the birth certificate, whether it's an unmarried mom. The only illegitimate son with God is an undisciplined son. So you can be legitimate and still be a bastard with God if we don't discipline our kids, especially our boys. And if we don't, we're a reprobate. Reprobate. I've told this many times, they, there was a chemistry test. If you ever go to uh, sell your gold, you know, it could be fool's gold. It could be fake gold. You don't, and they don't know if it's 14 carat or 12 carat, whatever, by looking at it. So they do this little scratch test. I've seen it done. They pour this little thing of uh, whatever on it, a little acid, and it 
It tells them whether it's true gold or not. And they had that chemistry test back in the Bible. And if it was pyrite, if it was fool's gold, they threw that material out. It was a junk pile. It was discarded. That's, discard, that's what the word reprobate is. Somebody that God rejected. Somebody that, something, that, something that God discarded. Rejected. You know what scares me? I uh, cheat a little bit to, ahead of my sermon, and I don't have this on my slide, but in Numbers 14, 34, do you know what God told Moses to say to the people? You shall know my rejection. You shall know my... I don't want anyone in this congregation, I don't want anyone, period, to know the rejection of God. You know, we live in this age of fairness. Everybody wants to be fair. Everybody, the customer's always right. And everybody should get a fair meal and a fair deal. Who was that, FDR? The new deal? The raw deal? Yeah, right, everybody? Can you imagine on the judgment day, God says, you shall know my rejection. You know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I want to know the truth of God. I want to be delivered from the devil. I want to be delivered from the bondage of sin. And I want to know the truth of Jesus Christ. And I want to be set free. And I want to know Jesus Christ. I don't want to know God's rejection. God was fed up. What else am I going to say? Numbers 14.10, the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? You know, they didn't, did you think they cared about how the Lord felt? You know, everybody's worried about feelings today. Well, I feel this and I feel that. Well, what do you feel? Well, I feel that. You know, when is the last time anybody asked, how does the Lord feel? I wonder, you know, how does it make the Lord feel? What does the Lord get out of it? What does Jesus get out? How about of our friendships? You know, we want to be good friends, don't we? We want to give. We don't want to take. Friend in need is a friend indeed. We don't want to be a fair-weather friend. What does Jesus get out of our friendships? What does Jesus get out of our marriage? What does he get out of our home, marriage, and family? What is church about? Are we just a social organization and churches for friends? Are we here to just socialize? We could socialize for two hours. Why is it so hard to get everybody to quit talking when the, when the call to worship comes, when Brandon kicks into his prayer? I love the fellowship, but that's not the reason for the church. It's a part of what we do, but it's not our main purpose. What is our main purpose? Come back next week. I'm going to begin a new series about our purpose, our goal. Then I have another school of thought, churches for kids. Reminds me of that cereal commercial we grew up with. Silly rabbit, church is for kids. It's not for adults. It's not for me, middle-aged me. It's for, it's for kids and grandparents. You know, church is always for somebody other than myself, right? Isn't that the way it is? Or, you know, the preacher preaches on husbands or wives. You know, man, I wish my wife was here to hear that sermon. You know, it's always for somebody else, isn't it? Wish my husband would have been there to hear that message. Then... There's other uh, school of thought. Church really is not for kids. It's actually for uh, married couples when they have kids because they need uh, something to help them, you know, raise their kids. Some people church, treat church like it's a babysitting service. I, many people we've had, you know, dump their kids off. You get uh, two free hours of babysitting service. I'm just thankful that we have our people who are back there with the kids. They work hard carrying the kids around. It's not easy trying to juggle a lesson and you got a toddler on your, on your waist. It's not easy and they do it. Why do they do it? Because they love the Lord. They don't get paid. Don't get paid for making these beautiful. Queen Esther. They do it because they love Jesus. How long will they, the people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? Listen to that. That one is hard. It's hard for me to wrap my feeble brain around. How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? That's the whole purpose of this message. They got so many signs and wonders, and they didn't believe. God could move a mountain. And yet he couldn't provide a daily meal. What's easier, to provide a daily meal or to move a mountain? 
A daily meal is a whole lot easier than moving a mountain. Have you ever tried parting a sea? The Red Sea, two or 3,000 feet in, uh, deep in some places? You know, there was a ferry of Muslims that got on one of those, well, the cars, the, the ferry. I mean, these are big ships, and the door, it's, uh, this happened up in uh, uh, Sweden. That sometimes they don't get those ferry doors, and uh, water got in, swept all the ships. Uh, swept all the cars down to one end, and these ferries went right down. It was up on the Baltic Sea. They happened in the Red Sea. And the ferry went right to the bottom just with a few seconds. And here this ferry, I, I, I read about it with such interest because it was in the Red Sea. When we're at the doctor's office reading those children's illustrated children's books, they got the Israelites walking across a mud puddle. The Red Sea isn't, too, isn't knee deep. I mean, this ferry of Muslims that were leaving Egypt to go to Mecca... Same situation. Unfortunately, the doors didn't get shut. The cars that went into the ferry, a wave of water got in there, swept them all down to the, to the bow of the ship, plunged right down to the bottom of that Red Sea. It was deep. And the Israelites saw that. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They walked across. Praise God it was parted, you know, otherwise their ears would be popping because of the, because of the pressure. But since the, since the water is parted and the air pressure comes down, it, everything was okay. They could walk across. They're probably looking up at this great wall of water. What would you do if you could look into the side of the water? You know, water is really not blue. It's clear, right? It's just the reflection of the sky on the water that makes it look blue. But I wonder if they could look in there and see. Maybe there were some fish. Maybe there were some deep uh, marine creatures that were floating around in there, and they could peek in and see some of those sea monsters that were there at the bottom of the Red Sea. Think that wouldn't be interesting? Be like going to one of these aquariums, you know, and you walk under. They got this special plexiglass and, you know, the sharks and all the, you know, the barracudas and stuff. And you're looking up at them and they're swimming around waiting for you to, you know, jump in. They're going to get you. You think, you know, would that be impressive? And yet they're wondering where they're going to get their next meal. God said, I will strike them down with a plague. I'm going to destroy them. And he told Moses, I'll make you into a great nation. Now, how God would have done that, how he would have made Moses into a great nation is uh, hard to figure out, but God was going to do it. He was fed up. And yet, look how, how godly Moses was, forgiving. Here, they're, they got rocks in their hand. They're ready to stone him. God's mad, and God's going to wipe them out. Can you imagine? Look at the big picture here. Moses is interceding for the guys that are going to stone him. They don't know that God's fed up with him and is going to wipe him out in a heartbeat. And here Moses is saying, uh, Lord, don't you uh, do that. Don't destroy him. It's flattering that you would start over again and make a great nation out of me and my descendants, but what will the Egyptians say? What will your enemies say? You brought your people all the way out here just to destroy him in the desert. They'll tell the inhabitants of the land about it. They've heard that you, Lord, are with these people, that you have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death and leave none alive, the nations who have heard this report are going to say that you were not able to bring these people into the land you promised them and that you destroyed them in the wilderness. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that make you feel good to know that we have a guy like Moses who can love his enemies. You know, I thought that was just something some philosopher made up, some poet. I didn't know that you could actually love your enemies. I thought that was just one of those sayings that nobody could do that Jesus gave. Is it possible we can love our enemies? Got to look at the big picture, don't you? You got to love the Lord an awful lot to be able to love your enemies. But Moses did. If Moses did, we can, we can do it, can't we? If Moses loved his enemies, I can love my enemies. You can love your enemies. Don't have to be friends, but you've got to love them. And give them to the Lord. The Lord will deal with them. What did God say? Numbers 14, 17. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger. Isn't that great? God is long-suffering. God's not a bully up in heaven going to zap people. There's a lot of people in religion that look at it that way. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that anybody, anyone should repent... Uh, I'm sorry, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. 
He's slow to anger. He abounds in love. He forgives sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people. This is Moses talking. Forgive the sin of this people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgotten that. I have forgiven them, as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me these ten times. There it is. The ten trials, the ten tests. God didn't test them. They provoked God. The Israelites provoked God ten times. That's the whole thesis. That's the whole theme we've been preaching. Numbers 14, verse 20, 22. They saw me, they disobeyed me, and they tested me ten times. Remember when uh, the devil tempted Jesus to jump off the temple? What did Jesus say? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. we got to please God, beloved. we got to please the Lord. That's the most important thing. doesn't matter if we please our husbands, please our wives, please our kids. I mean, that's all well and good. we got to please the Lord. If the Lord is happy, seek the Lord's approval. If God's happy, all other things will take care of themselves. But they treated the Lord with contempt. No one who treated me with contempt. How do we treat God? How do we treat him? But because my servant... Now, I'm kicking into my second point here. And I concluded last week, and I said, you know, whatever we do with the Lord, we got to do wholeheartedly. We're not going to make anybody serve God. God doesn't make anybody love him. You know, after Jesus did this, what's left to say? What's left for God to say? That was a last, you know, God played his last card at Calvary. What an ace he laid down at the foot of the cross, amen? amen. And there's nothing left to say. Started the church, founded the church on the day of Pentecost. The gospel is as easy as A, B, C. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, A, all. B, the wages of sin is death, but, B, but, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. C, Jesus said, all ye who are willing, come. A, B, C. That's all. It's the whole gospel in, a, in an A, B, C. We try to come up with sermons and all this you know, material, and, but it's just A, B, C. Come. Maybe the Lord will bring somebody this morning who has something to share on their heart. Come. The Spirit says come. That's the way the book of Revelation. John ends. You know, come. The, the Spirit says to the bride, Come into the heavenly portals. Come. I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants, Caleb and Joshua. Don't have to make anybody. We were, Friday night, it was Christian Kingdom College time. We were riding up the Revelation, uh, Revelation class up in Winchester. And uh, it got back to me. We, we left early. The guys left early to set up uh, for the class. We would like to video it and put it up the lessons, the classes, and a challenge was given to the young people. We're not going to make you go. You don't, Jesus doesn't want anybody. If you've got if, if you to make somebody do something for the Lord, then uh, he'd rather you not even come at all. He'd rather you not even do it or go at all. If it's not with a whole heart, then it's with no heart at all. It's better not to do anything. Right. We have a God. He's, he wants you either wants us hot or cold, doesn't he? Don't do anything lukewarm. If you don't feel like coming on Sunday morning, stay home. It was VBS time, and they asked Pap Pap to play the devil. You know, uh, you can turn it around on a devil sometimes. I like human nature. You know how human nature, we're so rebellious. It's just in our, it's in our genes, isn't it? And uh, so they dressed Pap Pap up like the devil, and uh, he was in this big, big red robe, and Pat Pat was smart. He want, you know, the devil has to have some, some kind of book in his hand. So my dad went out and got a, grabbed the Book of Mormon out of the archive of his library. And he went around the vacation Bible school, and there were all the kids on the property, and he held that book up and said, I got a new revelation. 
And the kids are all going, no! He says, don't read your Bibles. Read this book. And the kids were like, no, we're going to read our Bibles. We're not going to read that book. They didn't even know what it was, but they were, it was reverse psychology, see? And he says, stay at home. Don't come to church. Stay at home. No, we're coming to church. I, I, I got a kick out of it. The only person who didn't like it was Grandma. Pap Pap's mom, Helen, she didn't like it, but stay home, drink beer, smoke cigarettes. <laughs> no, we're not. You know, is that what it takes? I mean, are we like little kids and you got the devil on one side vying for our attention and you got the Lord over here at such a disadvantage all the way up in heaven on his heavenly throne? Hey, the Lord's at a disadvantage because, and, and the people who truly love are always at a disadvantage because love is so... It's not easily discerned. It's not readily interpreted. You know, it, it comes out like in these relationships. You know, you got a, a girl who's dating this guy. He's just a bum. He's a loser. He's selfish. He's got, and you try to tell that girl, you're just falling in love with a loser. He's no good. And they're like, I, I don't want to hear it. You know, they just plug up their ears. I mean, their, their mind is met. They made their decision with their hormones and their, uh, you know, affections and their, and then they find out what a terrible guy it was, and you say, I, why? She, and the girl says, why didn't you tell me? You know, that's the way the Lord is sometimes. You know, the Lord's like our best friend who knows, able to search our hearts and knows right from wrong and knows what's good, what's evil, and what's beauty, beautiful, and what's ugly, and vile, and evil. And he's at such a disadvantage. He loves us. He's, he's done everything he can for our spiritual benefit. And why don't we take advantage of it? Whatever you do, do it with, with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for man. You know, I made a mistake last week. I, I stood corrected. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't speaking. I was speaking off the cuff and not by preparation. I got the chapter of Deuteronomy wrong. It wasn't 23. It was 28. I was thinking about Matthew 23. Deuteronomy 28. I, I just want to put this in here. I'm winding down. Did you know that God revealed to Moses the end of, of Judaism? I know we have people today that say they're Jews. They're not genealogical Jews. I mean, I can put a yarmulke on my head and eat kosher food, put a menorah in my window at Christmas time, December, Hanukkah time, and I can say I'm a Jew, but does that make me a Jew? I mean, we can adopt Ju Judaism, and I'm not saying that the people who call themselves Jews today don't have the spirit. It's, pro it's possible that somebody could have the spirit of Judaism, but they're not ethnic. They're not true Abrahamic genealogical Jews. In fact, most of the Jews today, they came from the land of Khazaria. It was a great empire in the 7th to 12th century. Uh, the Mongolian invasion pretty much uh, brought them into decline. Militarily, economically, they were absorbed into modern-day Russia, Poland, Ukraine. The people who are Jews today, you have the Ashkenazi, the Germanic Jews. You have the Sephardim, the Sephardic Jew of uh, Spain. And they go back to about, I mean, if you can trace their history, it goes back to about the 13th, 12th century A.D. But in order to be a real legal Jew, you have to have the genealogical records going back to Abraham. Do you know the last genealogical Jew, the last true legal Jew who ever lived, who could prove in a court of law that he was a Jew? Do you know the last Jew who ever lived in Matthew chapter 1 was Jesus Christ? He could still prove he was a Jew today because we have his genealogy. Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and there's the genealogy. Matthew chapter 1, right up front, first book of the gospel of the New Testament. What happened? Something happened, didn't it? Andy went over to Italy, visited Rome. Everybody knows the Colosseum, right? You know what the Colosseum represents? You don't build the biggest monument of your country without finances. It took a lot of material, took a lot of labor, engineers, workmen. That Colosseum is basically a trophy to Rome's destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's what it was built with. The money, the merchandise, all of the plunder 
plunder of Jerusalem. Rome destroyed Jerusalem. It was prophesied. Jesus prophesied it. He said, not one stone will be left standing on another. Jesus, they were praying for him on the cross. He said, women, don't weep for me. Weep for your own selves and weep for your children. Jesus wasn't happy about it. He said, they're going to put a siege wall around you. He said, what's going to happen is going to be the worst thing that ever happened. There won't be anything uh, up to it, leading up to it, and after it, the horror that's going to come, the unspeakable horror of the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus prophesied it. Daniel prophesied it. But do you know Moses, all the way back 1,400 years before Christ, do you know Moses in the end, the, one of the last chapters of Deuteronomy, not the last chapter, but 32 chapters, but as he's winding down the five books of Moses, Moses got a, a picture from the mountaintop of the end of Judaism. God already told him they're hard-hearted people, they're stubborn, they're stiff-necked. All the signs I gave them, it didn't impress them. You know, beloved, I'm impressed. Never lose your sense of awe. We shouldn't even use the word awesome, should we, Amanda? Amanda told her kids, I don't ever want you to say awesome anymore. Those are for the things that belong to God, the things that drop your jaw. That's what awe is. I mean, a home runs are great, but home runs are a dime a dozen nowadays. It, it's not awesome. Now, a virgin birth, that's awesome. You know, Feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes, that's awesome. Saying, peace be still, and whoom, a big nor'easter storm turns into a Pacific Ocean. That's awesome. It didn't phase the Israelites. It didn't phase them. They were so hard-hearted. Let's never get to the point. Let's never get to the point where we lose, where that God doesn't impress us anymore. We lose our sense of awe at the things of God's creation and handiwork and master plan. The greatest work that God should be doing is in our own heart and in our own life. And here's, I, I, I don't want to go into it, and there's some graphic things I think we'll leave out. I don't want anybody losing their appetite and getting queasy. There's things in here that Moses said would happen. He said that God's going to bring a nation down on you, and they're going to swoop down like an eagle. You know, it's funny he mentions the eagle, and I don't want to read too much into it, but you know what the insignia of Rome was, right? It's the insignia of America, too. It's the eagle. He says, this nation is going to come down to you from far away. They're going to swoop down on you like an eagle. They're not going to have any respect for your young or for your old. They're not going to have any pity on you. Here's what else Moses said. And this is in Deuteronomy. They're going to lay siege to your cities throughout your land and your high fortified walls. You know, Israel didn't have high fortified walls. All Israel had was a, was a tent. They had a tabernacle. A tabernacle is an old King James word for a tent. They had a, a cloth made out of goat's camel hair. How did Moses know that they would have a big high wall and fortifications made out of stones and brick? How did Moses know? God revealed it. He's not talking about Israel of this time. He's looking at the end, their end. They're going to besiege all your cities throughout the land. Those fortified walls in which you trusted are going to come tumbling down, aren't they? There's a picture here, an artist's rendition, David Roberts, 1850, of the destruction of Jerusalem. The Roman armies came in. It wasn't easy. I mean, the Jews weren't sissies. They didn't go down without a fight. The campaign began in April, and it ended in August, September, kind of like a Major League Baseball season. Began in April, ended in October, early October. They destroyed that city, burned it down. There's the arch of Titus. Vespasian, who came after Titus, built that arch to commemorate. Took all the money and put, built that arch and built the Colosseum from the spoils and the plunder. And Andy had, and Michael Rodriguez had the opportunity to see this famous arch of Titus that took place after Revelation was completed. We have an early date to the book of Revelation. 70 A.D., the end of Judaism, and Moses prophesied it. Deuteronomy 28. You look there, and Andy got, brought back some beautiful shots. When you look at that arch of Titus there, here's uh, scenes that are depicted on that arch, and, and time, the ravages of time have have eroded, but they're still visible there to see. 
And there are the Roman soldiers and the slaves that were captured carrying off that famous menorah, that famous golden candlestick worth a fortune. And they, it was so heavy with the weight of the talents of gold, they had to take several men to carry it on their shoulders. And they carried off the light from the Jewish tabernacle. And you know what Jesus said? It reminded me of that passage. Could that happen to us today? Where that God would take the candle away? In Revelation 2, 5, he says, Consider how far you've fallen and repent and do the things you did at first. You know, if that's all that we remember this morning, let's go back and never lose our love for Jesus Christ. If we've gotten a little loosey-goosey, if we've uh, fallen away a little bit, we can, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of repentance. We can go back and rekindle the flame of our first love, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, Jesus said, I'll come to you and remove the lampstand. Isn't that terrible? They removed the lampstand from its place. And Jesus, it says, came to his own. His own received him not. They cried out, let his blood be on us and our children. Oh, um, it may, gives me goosebumps to think of the words that were the curses that were sworn by the enemies at the foot of the cross. They said, let his blood be on us and our children. And God did. And they cried out, we have no king but Caesar. And God gave them Caesar as their king. And that was what happened. You know, we need to be careful what we say. In Numbers 14, it says, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And they said, if only we had died in Egypt. Wouldn't it be three times they said this? And I cut this quote off a little bit here so I could get it on one slide. In Numbers 14, 2 through 4, do you know three times the Jews said we'd rather be back in Egypt? And they grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they said to them, if only we had died in Egypt, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You know where the Romans shipped? Anybody who wasn't killed in the destruction of Jerusalem, do you know what happened to all the captives? You know, they need to have money to pay for their campaign. If you're going to fight a war, you want to have the treasure, you want to have the spoils of war. Do you know how Rome made money? They sold all the hard work and the young people that could, could be slaves. They put them on ships, and they, they sailed them to sell into slavery in Egypt. And Josephus writes about this in 100 A.D. But do you know Moses said 1,400 years prior, 1,500 years, Moses predicted what would happen? You know, they finally got their request. They, they kept telling Moses, they kept telling God, we want to go back to Egypt, we want to go back to Egypt. You know what happened? It blows my mind. The Romans put them on ships and sent them back to Egypt, Numbers 28, to sell them into slavery. And the prophecy said, no man will buy you. No man will want you. There was such unsanitary conditions, health disease, some sexual diseases, uh, medical conditions, the ravages of the plagues that broke out, and the starvation of the famine. And the harbor master in the port of Alexander, Egypt, refused to allow the ships of Jewish slaves to come in to the harbor, the great lighthouse in Alexandria, Egypt. No man wanted them. Yes, we need to remember our first love. We need to live wholeheartedly. Give Christ our whole heart. We don't want to wait until the end when there's nothing we can do. We need to live every day as though Jesus is Lord of our lives. You know, I'm preaching to the choir, am I not? We have Sister Louisa Garinger down from Delaware. Her dad, Frank, is a great preacher man, and he likes to teach the kids at camp. You know, one of the questions he always asks, he asks, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? It shocked me when I first heard him ask that, do you love Jesus? Shouldn't that go without saying? It should go without saying, shouldn't it? But you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized the validity of that question. It's a valid question. It's a legitimate question. Do we love Jesus? Do I love Jesus? Do you love Je Jesus, David Mace? Do you love him, Andy Barton? Do you love him? Sister Sue, Sister Ruby, do we love Jesus? I want to confess without any hesitation this morning, I'm not ashamed. I love Jesus with all my heart. Won't you?
Is there anybody that wants to come this morning and make a decision for Christ? Is there anybody that may have a testimony to share of what Christ, what good things that Christ has done? You come forward at this time. Amen. Let's have the men come forward. Let's come around the Lord's table. Let's examine ourselves. And let's celebrate the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. Again, we know on the, on the first day of the week, according to the, the book of Acts and Acts chapter 2, that the apostles, they broke bread the first day of the week, uh, like we're getting ready to hear for the Lord's Supper. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, again, verse 23 says, pa Paul's writing, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26 says, uh, for when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And uh, this verse 27, my brothers preached on the Israelites today, uh, how they were stiff-necked, stiff obstinate. They didn't believe uh, after all the signs. But this verse 27, uh, I think we all really need to, it's a warning, in my opinion, uh, we need to heed this, that therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks a cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of, of the Lord. Uh, as I was thinking about this uh, meal today, uh, there was a parable in, in Luke 13. Uh, I'll read it real quickly and just, uh, just, just, just think about this. Uh, Luke 13 and verse 22 Jesus, as he was passing through one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem, and someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. Uh, that, this dawn over there, we're, we're eating and drinking in the presence of the Lord right now. Uh, whether this is the same thing, I think that's up to us, who are, wh whatever you think. But Then when you uh, will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in your streets, and he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from, me, depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out, and they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are, the, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. So brothers, let's just, uh, brothers and sisters, let's remember the death of Jesus right here. <clears throat> 